Hello guys, welcome to the live stream. I'm gonna now, every time I start these streams, I worry that it isn't actually, it's, it's, it's not live for some reason because I don't always see what's going on on YouTube, but StreamYard is saying I'm live. So from now on, I'm just gonna start talking and get, getting straight into it. So firstly guys, I hope you're well. If you're joining me live, thank you very much. It's very much appreciated. I keep trying different times for these lives and um, it's interesting to see how many people turn up for each one. So. It's always appreciated though. As always, if you're watching this now live or if you're watching it in the future, then please think about subscribing and hitting the like button if you've enjoyed the video by the end of it. Uh, and also the Substack newsletter, which is always linked in the description, is definitely worth checking out. Obviously, I'm going to say that because it's my Substack newsletter, um, but it's free. Every Friday, I send out a written um, kind of rambling behind the scenes from here. People seem to like it, but if you don't like it, you can just leave. So anyway, they're the two plugs done. And on to today's topic. So as always, I've got something I want to talk about today, which is at the top of my mind. Um, but also, there's the opportunity for you guys to ask questions if you're on the live stream. Equally, if you're watching this in the future, ask a question in, in, in the comments. I'll, I'll still re reply and uh, read and reply to those. Um, but yeah, we'll come on to Q&As in a bit. Th they are the bit when these lives really come alive, if you excuse the pun, because you guys have such interesting questions. So start noting them down if they, if they come to mind while I'm talking. Equally, if you've come armed with questions, please do. And that's all of the housekeeping done. It's very boring. Um, so the thing that I want to talk about today is my website because it forms a massive part of what I do. It's a huge element of Mark Ellis Reviews and Solo Club to a degree. Uh, but we're focusing really on Mark Ellis Reviews for, for, this, uh, for this discussion. And um, the reason I want to talk about it is because I've just been interviewed uh, by a guy who works in the SEO field, so search engine optimization. I'm sure you, you know what that stands for. And um, he was asking me lots of questions about my website. And it, was, it was one of those things where... I was replying and answering his questions. And while I was replying, I was thinking, wow, I'd never thought about it like that before. Or, yeah, that, that's actually quite a good point. Or, more impressively, I think I know what I'm doing. And that's what, it's one of those things that when you're running a business like this, it's very, you have very, very little time, trust me, as I'm sure you know, to sit back and kind of survey you know, your surroundings and what you've achieved. So it's nice to kind of have these questions asked of you, and then that gets your brain thinking about what you've built. Um, and my website, the markellisreviews.com, if you've not been there, obviously that's, that's the one that I'm referring to. That is something which I created right at the start of this, this kind of mini empire that I've built. And I've not really touched it since, apart from adding content to it nearly daily. And what's happened is that that website has grown to a point where it attracts anywhere between three to 4,000 unique hits a day, which isn't massive in you know uh, website terms. You know, the likes of TechCrunch and Mac Rumors, etc., cetera, are pulling in much bigger than num numbers than that, trust me. And, but for me, for little old me, it's significant. And it's, it's got to a point where it's generating interesting revenue from an ad point of view. And also, it's given me another thing to go to uh, to, you know, to um, sponsors with to say, look, there's a, a big audience here that you can tap into as well. So it's a, it's a very significant part of my business. And as you may know, as I've talked about in the past, it forms an incredibly important part of the production process. So a video that ends up on the YouTube channel always pretty much, in fact, 99.9% .9 of the time starts life as a blog post on that website and it gets turned into a video published and away you go. So without the website, arguably, I wouldn't have a YouTube channel. I might have a YouTube channel, but it wouldn't be very good. So it's incredibly important. I am going to bring it up now on the screen. It's the first time I've done this. Um, Let's see if I can make it work. <laughs> Bear with me. Talk amongst yourselves. Uh, let's do it that way. That's a bit small. This is StreamYard, by the way, um, that I'm using for this, which is absolutely fantastic. It's been a, it's been a great tool for doing this stuff. But um, okay, so I'm, I'm rambling now. But this is my website, if you haven't seen it before. Now, I make no apologies, possibly, about the state of the ads on this site. It is absolutely full of them. So if you go into, I mean, this is the home page, but if I go into one of the uh, articles. So today's blog post, for instance, 
doesn't look too bad at the minute, but if I start scrolling down, we do start to see, we see a video, which is technically an ad as well, uh, but we do start to see a fair few ads pop up. Um, and I, I'll be honest, I don't like it. It's, it's not a great user experience. They're not even loading on here for some reason. It might be because I'm sharing possibly, but um, you'd normally see ads here. And here we go. Here they come. Um, you can see what I've been searching for now because obviously it's following my cookies. Uh, lots of hotels from the looks of it. But it's, yeah, it's full of ads and the content is there, as you can see, but they are, it's surrounded by ad ad advertisements. And the reason those ads are there is because they do provide some pretty good revenue every month. I mean, to give you an idea, it can range from anywhere between $1,200 to over $2,000 a month on ad revenue. Now, I'm a businessman. As much as I love doing this, and I do this partly for the love of it, love of it, I am doing it as a business. So, I don't, I wouldn't believe anyone who would say to me, "Well, I, I, out of you know principles of you know decent web web experience and you know maintaining my artistic credibility, I'm going to remove those." I, I, you you won't. You'll you'll leave them on there if it's making nearly two thousand dollars a month. Trust me. But it's not the long game. So the long game with this is to remove these ads completely and just have dedicated sponsors, which will be a much cleaner experience, probably more profitable as well. Um, but I'm not quite there yet. Anyway, that's a little bit off topic. Um, but this is my website. So I built this, guys. I, this, I didn't, you may, may nod and say, well, clearly you have. Um, but I, I didn't pay anyone to build it. Um, I've got a fairly decent knowledge of WordPress, which is what this website sits on. Um, but I didn't, like I said, I didn't, I didn't bring in a web developer. I didn't bring in a web designer. I just did the whole thing myself back in 2020 when I started this brand or when I started the Mark of This Reviews brand. And it's like the, the design hasn't changed. The, the bricks and mortar of this website are as they were three years ago. The only thing that changes is that I keep publishing content to it, basically. But it's ranking really, really well. And what you might be surprised, in fact, no, let, me, let me show you two examples of how well it's ranking. So if, for instance, I search Google for iPhone 13 mini battery, which a lot of people do because people are interested in how long the battery lasts on that tiny iPhone. If we scroll down, we can see laptop mag, Apple, which is interesting, actually, but uh, Apple is there, which is fair enough. Uh, DX Mark, DXO Mark, rather. Some videos from YouTube, no surprise. Um, and then suddenly, little old me, I appear above I fix it. <laughs> so so a, a, an article that I wrote, which is the sad truth about the iPhone 13 mini, doesn't even say battery in the title, interestingly, um, is ranking really high. So what is it? It's, it's one, two, it's the fourth, the fourth uh, uh, blog post basically in that list or the fourth website in that list is little old me. Uh, another example is Remarkable. So Remarkable is a tablet, basically a writing tablet. I, I did a review of this a little while ago. And if I search for Remarkable review, a lot of people are interested in this, by the way. Uh, we've got Expert Reviews, PC Magazine. That yeah, makes sense. Uh, who else have we got? Wired, big publication, Tech Radar, Stuff, Trusted Reviews, The Gadgeteer, all quite big uh, publications. And, oh, Mark Ellis Reviews on page one of Google, that coveted page one, which a lot of people pay an awful lot of money to get onto through SEO and all sorts of uh, you know ads and stuff like that. Just to reiterate, I've not paid anyone anything for these positions. All I've done is write these blog posts. That's it. And that, both of these, in fact, one of them is a review. So if I go into the Remarkable Review, it's a, you know, it's a standard review of that product. Hopefully my website is, wouldn't that be great if my website died while I was doing this? Um, here it is. Big image of it, some text, the video, the YouTube video, which I'll come on to in a bit. And then just a standard review, some nice images and stuff. Great. The um, iPhone 13 mini battery piece. Uh, sorry, I hate that word piece. The iPhone 13 mini battery article. If I go into that, that's not a review. It's more of an opinion type guide thing. But I need to say piece again. It's more of a guide really to how well the battery lasts. A bit of a, it's more of, an, more of an opinion on the battery life of the iPhone 13 mini. It's not really, it's not even... Is it a guide? I don't know. It's just a bit of amusing about it, really. But for whatever reason, 
that's ranking even higher than the remarkable one, which I think the remarkable one has more words. Anyway, all this to say, I've got two very highly ranking articles there. And I've just done them, I've written them off my own back, I've published them off my own back, and I've, I'm not an SEO expert. Now, I do have a background in marketing, which you might be aware of. So my previous role to Marcos Reviews uh, was a marketing role. I used to do my own external marketing. Before that, I worked in sales as well and all sorts of stuff. So along the way, I've, I have met and worked with a lot of very good SEO people, so people who really understand search engine optimization. And I've loved it. I've, I've absolutely loved learning from them. But I, I do not at all count myself as an expert. I basically apply the absolute basics to what I do. So what I do in, in, in terms of SEO, as far as I go, is the title, obviously. The title is incredibly important. My business thrives on titles. If I get the title wrong, no one clicks the video or the blog. And I don't build, build an audience and I don't make any money. So it's that important. So I, I, put, I always make sure that there's a keyword of some description or something which people are going to be searching for in the title. I then make sure on the website, obviously, that the uh, the header image has a what, what's called an alt tag, which is basically the keyword placed behind that image. That's very important for Google. Um, and then I add a meta description, which is the thing that you see in the search results when you're, when you're in Google and you, you're searching through the search results. Um, that's it. I have some internal links, so I do. I make sure there's a few internal links on the website. So if I'm talking about the Remarkable 2 tablet and I happen to mention the iPad mini, for instance, I'll make sure that the, that the word, uh, that the um, phrase iPad mini is linked back to an, an article on the website that has iPad mini. And occasionally I do some outbound linking, but I don't do anything more than that. That is literally all I do. And that's that has been the case with those two uh, blog posts that I've just shown you. The other thing, <clears throat> excuse me, the other thing that I do, which I think is making a big difference, is I just, I know how to write this stuff. So I'm quite proud of the way that I write. I'm a, I'm a writer first and foremost. I have been all of my life. And I know how to write these reviews and these opinion pieces. So I don't, when I'm writing, I'm not thinking about keywords. I'm not thinking, oh, I need to have at least you know, 10 mentions of the iPhone 13 mini in the art, in, in, the, in, the, in the story. I don't think that. I just write it. And I write it with the audience in mind. So I'm thinking of the, the person who is going to be watching or reading, sorry, that particular article. And that's it. That is all I do. And, and these, these blog posts are written relatively quickly. They're written within an hour normally and published. You know, publishing takes about 10 minutes, if that. It's really straightforward stuff. And I just keep doing this. I, again, it's the consistency thing. I keep doing it. And as a result of that, you start to see results like this. Now, what's fascinating about this and what this conversation I got into earlier with this, with this SEO guy is that it illustrates how Google works and how smart Google is. And I think there's often quite a big misconception about SEO. So my personally, my previous understanding of SEO several, year, several years ago was that it was always this kind of cat and mouse game between Google and SEO experts. Basically, it started a long, long time ago when people realized that for a website to rank highly on Google, you could trick Google, basically. So you could put loads of links in the footer, you could hide them, have them, you know, have the text the same color as the background so that the user couldn't see them, but have all the links in there that were kind of linking off to different places. And basically, you're gaming it. So you're gaming the system so that your website ranks as highly as possible. And then what would happen is that Google would catch on to that and think, ah, you're not doing that anymore. We're going to get rid of that completely. That will not work. Bang. Suddenly that stops working. So those SEO experts find another way to trick Google or to game the system, which I can't remember the, what happened after that, to be completely honest. But it was this, like I say, cat and mouse thing where it was links, then it was something else, then it was something else. It was like, oh, we need to stay one step ahead of Google to make our website work. Now, clearly, that's not sustainable. It's not particularly, I think the key thing with that is it's not user friendly. It's not keeping the audience in mind. All it's doing is thinking, how can we get our website as high as possible on Google just by gaming the system? You're not thinking like I am audience. I need to create content that is right for the audience. You're thinking, I just need to beat Google. Now, we've got to the point, thankfully, where Google is way too smart for that. That Those days are just gone. They've vanished completely. 
And what's happened now is that because Google is so smart and because of things like, and I'm sorry to always mention it, AI, which has always been in the, in the background for this for, for a long time, lo much longer than the likes, you know, the likes of ChatGPT have been around. As that, that stuff has got more sophisticated, the, the way that Google ranks websites has changed to the point where it knows exactly what it's looking at. So it looks at my blog post and it thinks, okay, that's written with, with the right tone. It seems to include the, all the sections that you know, the audience who wants to see this stuff and who are using the, the search terms related to this sort of stuff would want to read. It's unique. It seems to tie in with other stuff this person's written. And, oh, look, he's got a, a YouTube channel as well, which links back to the website, and he's embedded the video version of this blog post in the, um, you know, in, in, the website, in, in the website blog post. This looks like a pretty good article. Let's give it, let's make sure more people see it. It's as simple as that. Go Google is basically basically thinking we want, the right we want to serve the right content at the right time to the right people when you think about it it's absolutely not rocket science as the user we're all good well you may not be a google user but we're all internet users we all want to find things online and as long as we type something in and we get stuff back that is relevant we're happy and if we're happy we keep going back to that search engine for more and that's how they build their own audience so it's not rocket science at all Another great example of this is YouTube. There's lots of misnomers and I think misconceptions about YouTube that it's all about, again, gaming the algorithm or, you know, somehow overcoming the algorithm gods and all this rubbish. It's not. It's about making good content that is relevant for your audience. If you can do that, your videos will perform well. It's as simple as that. And again, a bit like Google itself, YouTube is incredibly clever. It knows what's going on in videos. It's not just looking at the description and the title and the, the thumbnail. It's actually watching your videos. The, the, the AI that powers that platform can see what's going on in the video. That's absolutely true. And that gives you an idea of how much data they can gather about content and how they can analyze content and make sure it works for the audience. So all this to say <laughs> that you, you don't have to be technically proficient with SEO to make your website work. It's as simple as that. Now, this isn't in any way kind of uh, diminishing the responsibility of SEO, real SEO experts. It's, it really is an art form, and it's something which is worth investing in if you have a website which needs significant traffic fairly quickly and you don't have the time to create the content and to, you know, to, to invest in the, the small things that I do, relative, relatively small things that I do for my content. If you haven't got that, SEO is absolutely worth investing in. Like I said, I've got lots of very good friends in that industry. So I'm not in any way <laughs> diminishing their the role they play on, on, on the internet. But I've managed somehow to create this website that has, like I say, three to 4,000 unique hits a day, which for me is very nice. It works very well uh, without really investing much, if any, time in SEO. So the moral of the story with this, guys, is to just concentrate on, cr on creating great content. That's all you've got to do. Be consistent, know who your audience is, and cr keep creating content. Don't think about the algorithm too much. And don't get bogged down in the technical aspect of SEO because you don't need to. Simple as that. So that was the, like I say, the moral of the story, the story behind my website, which hopefully will be relatively interesting. Um, and as always, hi, Alex. Uh, hi, Alex. Hi, Luke. Hi, Johan. Hi, David. Everyone who's commented. Uh, great to see you guys. Um, but yeah, that's enough of me waffling on about my website. Um, over to you for questions, which gives me a chance to have a very quick drink of water. Uh, but yeah, just ask me anything, guys. Go for it. The only thing I do have to say is that this isn't a tech channel, so I do occasionally get tech questions, which is fine. I don't mind perhaps one. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll let you have one tech question. There you go. Uh, but yeah, if we can keep to this sort of stuff, content creation and solopreneurship, that would be great. Um, by the way, Alex Tech, who has just joined the chat, if you haven't seen my interview with him, it's on the on this Solo Club channel. I think it's the last video that I published. Go and check it out. It's it's absolutely brilliant. And um, I had a horrendous time editing it, which wasn't anyone's fault, apart from 
potentially partly mine um but regardless of that um it's live it's it's a brilliant conversation thanks to alex um and alex summed it up really well when i, t- I spoke to him i think he, he mentioned this on twitter actually um which is that it's one of those conversations that as someone in our position now who you know we've achieved some success it's one of those things that you th- look at and you think i wish i had access to that conversation three years ago when I first started. Um, So if you're looking to do this sort of stuff, please check it out. He gives away some fantastic advice. Um, Thank you, Alex, again. Right, we have a question. First question. Do just ask anything, guys. Don't be shy. Uh, Mike. Hi, Mike. Uh, Regular. Uh, How do you find the people... How do you find the people who do your outsourcing? Great question. Um, So at the moment, I outsource uh, PR, accounting bookkeeping boring stuff um pr is not boring but the, the other two are uh what else sorry if there's any accountants on the line by the way on the line uh, on on the live um what else will i outsource uh short form production so short form chopping up of long form videos that's all outsourced uh publishing that's pretty much it i think um so it's a mixture really mike so the the pr uh, people that work for me um they were just a, a mutual connection introduced us basically it was a case of Mark, I think you need to talk to this person. And I did, and it, we hit things off, and you know, so far it's been pretty good. Um, the others, the other guys, uh, one of them, the guy who does the short form stuff actually was a friend recommendation. So my mate who is a, a lecturer at Northampton University in the UK, um, one of his students um, is doing the short form video editing for me because my mate said, look, I think he, he might be worth talking to. This, this lad is really keen on doing this stuff. Um, so I did have a chat with him and he's great. He, he does such a good job. Um, the other two guys um, are basically, oh, I've got a VA as well. Again, that was a mutual connection. Uh, the other two though uh, were through LinkedIn. Funnily enough, I just put a little advert on LinkedIn and they got in touch. And again, it's worked out really well. I absolutely recommend outsourcing things when you get to the stage of being able to do that. Question from Alex. Uh, As you grow, how do you decide what sponsors to prioritize? Uh, Oh, it's really hard. Although Alex knows a lot about this himself. Um, How do I how do I prioritize sponsors? I think as the, the more experience you get with this the more you you kind of start to learn which sponsors are least likely to waste your time and again Alex will know about this that you can waste a, an ungodly amount of time dealing with sponsors who one don't really have the budget they say they have or they don't mention the budget anyway um, and eventually it turns out that they don't have any budget um, and secondly the ones who will they might have the budget and they seem okay at the outset, but they are an absolute nightmare when it comes to content approval, going backwards and forth with, you know, changing things and asking for different stuff. All this stuff only comes from from experience, really, and I still get it wrong sometimes, but I can see signals now where I think, well, firstly, I, st- I start with the budget question. The first thing I say is how much money do you have to spend on this kind of partnership and i put it in their core rather than me saying look here's my pricing i always put it in their core because i want them to be up front and say look we've got this budget and and, and nine times out of ten they'll come back and say yes this is how much we can spend and either it's going to be a, a decent amount of uh, budget or it's going to be fairly you know, small in which case i know which decision to make straight away we don't go any further than that normally or we just say look when your budget improves come back you know where i am Um, The other thing is that, and this is harder to to judge, but there are some signals that kind of indicate that a sponsor or a brand might be a bit of a pain in the backside when it comes to approvals. Um, If they insist on sending you a great big lengthy contract um, and they have lots of bullet points um, in their emails about what they're expecting from from a, a 60 to 90 second integration on YouTube, alarm bells do start to ring. Um, And again, depending on the budget and the video you're putting them into, um, it's not always worth doing it. Sometimes it is. um, And like I say, I still occasionally get this wrong. I had it recently. I won't mention, obviously, the brand in question. um, But a video that is, uh, in fact, I can't say when it's going live, but a a fairly recent video um, is delayed because it should have gone live three days ago hasn't because my email wasn't properly responded to and uh, yeah it, it slowed everything down backed everything else up it's horrible I now roughly know why that's happened and I, I can I know I now know what those signals are um, so this is a really long way of answering of answering your question Alex but um I think that, I think the answer to it is uh, 
it's just instinct. I think and it's instinct that you develop over time, really. Uh, but you'll always get it wrong. I mean, um, we talk about this offline and we do occasionally screw up with this. Uh, and sometimes brands surprise you and they're lovely. You think they're going to be really terrible to, to work with and they're fantastic. So great question. Hi, Steve. Uh, I saw your recent video where you were using the DJI mics when traveling. How do you rate those over the Rode Go 2? Um, yeah, so well, I've never used the Rode Go 2, firstly, Steve, so I can't rate them against that, uh, you know, the, the age-old thing of don't review a product you've never tried. Um, but the DJI mics on their own are amazing. They're so convenient to use um, out in the field, so using, using them in the car, but also using them walking around London and various other places. Um, absolutely no bother whatsoever. It's it's again with it, with everything DJI DJI makes. It's the ability just to pull them out, stick it on you know, via either your, your little clip or via the um, the built-in magnet, um, and just press record and not worry about levels and all that stuff. And it's built-in storage. I can't think how much storage it's got, but it's loads. Battery lasts forever. Um, finish what you're recording. Stick it into your um, you know, your, your laptop with USB C transfer the file done it, it's that they're that useful to the point where i occasionally use them in this studio so if i'm doing a short form um video like a, a tiktok or something or a youtube short and i need to do a voiceover typically i would have come here got this great big mic turned everything on set up logic start recording takes forever now i just grab that dji mic press record start talking done i mean okay it's not going to sound as good as this short sm sm7b but no one cares because they can still hear me and people are listening to it on their phones. You know. um, so they're brilliant. But like I said, I've not tried the Rode Go 2, although I do hear pretty good things about them. Maybe if anyone else has tried them out in the chat, they could let us know. Right, James. Hi, James. Uh, if you were to update your medium slash writing ebook, would all the content stay the same? Uh, do you do anything differently now since you released it? Thanks. That's a Great question, James. Um, medium's a very interesting place at the minute, not necessarily for the right reasons. Weirdly enough, I've literally just uh, literally just uh, published a tweet thread on this, um, having a bit of a moan, because my views and um, revenue on Medium have dropped quite a bit over the last three... The last three months of revenue and views have been pretty pretty disappointing really and i haven't changed anything there's nothing i'm doing differently the, the tech industry it has been in a bit of a slump although things are really picking up now obviously with uh, wwdc uh, apple's event approaching next week um and there's been you know there's been launches from google and all sorts so that's not really an excuse anymore um i don't understand how a uh, so I'm going off on a tangent now. I'm going on a bit of a rant. Apologies, but I will come back to your question. Um, I don't understand how an account like mine with over 17,000 followers that publishes a very well-written, and it is uh, a very well-written, relevant, and, and incredibly timely story like I did today, can only achieve 16 views after three hours of being published. That never used to happen. And this is going through Mac O'Clock. So it's also, and it's not only going to my audience via email and through you know, the notifications and the, 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 the algorithm, if you like, on, on Medium. It's also going through Mac O'Clock, which has about 15,000 followers. And it's had 16 views. I'm sitting there thinking, that's just such a tiny number. It's, and I know you should celebrate every view, but when you get to a point where you're pulling in much bigger numbers elsewhere, and more importantly, previously, Medium has, de has, has delivered a very good audience for your stuff. It doesn't make any sense. And um, I think the, the reason I started moaning about that, James, is because the one thing I would change in that ebook is the stuff about boosting. So this wasn't a thing when I wrote the ebook, but um, basically, uh, Medium has introduced a thing called Boost, which is uh, it, it, it sort of replaces the original um, dis distribution thing, which is where a team of curators in at Medium HQ would pick out certain stories and give them an artificial boost in the algorithm. And that used to be called distribution. So you'd see in your in your story stats, it would say uh, chosen for, di for dis further distribution or something like that. And you'd see a big spike. It would really help it. And I, I used to get a lot of that. That used to happen quite a lot. And it was great because it, it brought the views up. And also, because it was done manually, you thought, well, someone's read, literally someone is reading this and thinking it's good enough to be boosted. And that's that's lovely. That's a lovely thing to, to kind of have in your head. Um, but they got rid of that. 
Um, and then they brought in this boosted thing, which is roughly the same. It's roughly the same principle. But the big difference with it is that it's not just um, medium staff that are boosting stuff. Basically, anyone, pretty much, although at the moment it's, it's limited to um, publication owners, I think, and, and, and editors. Uh, I, I'm one of the people that can do this. Um, basically, it, the, the, it's, it relies on people reading stuff on Medium and then submitting stories that they think are worth boosting to the Medium curation team. So the Medium curation team gets all these boost recommendations, looks at them, and then... On, based on a, a certain set of criteria, decides whether or not to tick the box and boost those articles. Now, like I mentioned a moment ago, the curation, the, the kind of manual curation thing was quite nice as a writer when it was working. Now that it's not working, maybe this is a selfish thing, maybe other people are seeing fantastic boost numbers, I don't know, but um, now that it's not really working and, and the views overall are down, it's frustrating because it's, it's quite a... Um, Having that manual curation method is quite, it feels a bit archaic, whereas no other platform that I can think of does this. YouTube doesn't do it. You know, there aren't people at YouTube, well, there are people at YouTube you know, vetting certain videos, but not in quite the same way. Everything is done by the algorithm, by AI. Same thing with Facebook, TikTok, Instagram. Medium kind of sits alone as this thing where they're trying to do this kind of very personalized human-led curation stuff and that is the thing like i say in, in the ebook um and certainly even the medium academy that was just finished um we covered that in the academy because it was happening while the academy was going on but it, it wasn't a thing during the, the the writing of the ebook so that's probably the biggest thing um and there will be another cohort of the academy which isn't going to be just based on medium by the way guys it's going to be an entire overview of my business and the way that I've built this kind of mini empire. That's the what the next academy is going to be about. You can sign up to, to hear about more about that in the in the description below. Um, but yeah, that's going to be that kind of stuff is going to, is going to be in the next, uh, hopefully the next version of the ebook and the next academy. But um, yeah, things are really changing at, at Medium, and I'm not sure I like it. I think, well, you can read my tweet thread today, see what you think. But um, yeah, <laughs> not not a happy camper at the moment. Great question, as always, though. Uh, and keep them coming, please, guys. Another one from Mike. Um, outside of product launch windows, how do you generate the ideas for your videos? Um, good question. I get this question quite a lot, actually, Mike. And obviously, product launch, product launch stuff is obvious because, you know, for instance, WWDC next week, it's pretty much guaranteed we're going to see something relating to VR from Apple, so some sort of headset thing. Um, so I've got stuff to write about with that which is fine. When that stuff isn't happening, it's more, again, I, I just, I've been doing this for a long time. So it comes very naturally, you know, ideation, as they call it, generating the ideas for these blog posts and for videos um, comes very naturally. Um, but it's about working with what you've got, really. And I've, I've done this right from the start of running the, the Marcos Reviews channel, in that I, if I've got a MacBook, so in front of me, I've got the, I've got the 16 inch MacBook Pro. Okay, it's, I bought it in 2020, excuse the, the motorbike going past. Um, I bought it in 2021. So technically, it's, you know, it's not an old laptop, but it, in terms of content and relevancy, it's knocking on a bit. I can still make videos about it. Absolutely. I can talk about, you know, two years later, I can talk about why it's too heavy for me. Um, the MacBook Air is a great example. I've made so many videos about the MacBook Air. And the reason I've done that is because they perform really well. I don't want to keep doing that. I, I, I'm not the sort of person who can just make 30 different MacBook Air videos and all of them be pretty much the same thing. I need to mix them in with other, with other stuff. But the way YouTube works and the way that the, the algorithm and your audience works is that they expect similar content, really. So um, I've got a lot of people who follow me who love the MacBook Air, who love the Mac Mini, who love the iPhone 13 Mini, who love the iPad Mini, and, and the AirPods Max, the Bose QC45s. I know, and the Remarkable 2 tablet, I know the products that I've, I've created content about that work, and it's those that I kind of fall back on when there isn't really much happening news-wise, basically. Or I do something fun like the um, the AI thing that I did recently over the weekend where I asked uh, uh, Google's Bard what it thought about the... What it, what, what it thought it was like to own an iPhone. A silly little video, but... It, it, yeah, it was it was a way of filling dead air, basically. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's, just, it's instinct, really, Mike, and just working with what I've got. Simple as that. Another question from Mike. 
See, Mike is leading the way with the questions, guys, but uh, keep them coming, please do. Uh, did you see a productivity increase when you got the studio compared to working at home? That's a brilliant question, and the answer is an unequivocal yes. Uh, definitely. I mean, I've always been productive, and I've always been the sort of person who uh, it can, can work from home and get a lot of stuff done. I'm, I'm, although there's lots of distractions there, uh, well, I think p particularly when it's your own business, it's much easier to avoid those distractions because if you don't work, you don't get paid. It's as simple as that. If you don't get paid, you can't pay the mortgage. Um, so it's quite a, it's quite a simple um, bit of math to, to, to work that out. But um, so that I've always had that ethic. Uh, but coming here has been amazing, and it's probably important to note actually that I don't just work from here. I have to mix it up. I'm, I'm not one of these people who can just stay in the same room five days a week and you know just go out for lunch I, i'd go mad and I've, I've, I've done that to a degree in here where i've done long days in here um i, I genuinely makes me feel a bit funny I, like I've, i'm like i'm a hermit and that's just after one day so i do have to mix it up so what i tend to do i mean today is a great example actually where um i did some work at home so every morning i work at home at the, at the breakfast bar get my blogging done email that sort of stuff um and then this morning I came here, uh, did some A-roll filming, so filmed the A-roll for tomorrow's video, uh, did a couple of the other little bits and pieces, and then went from here to the gym, which is only like a six, seven minute car ride away, um, got to the gym. The gym's got a lovely bit where you can, a place where you can work, um, set myself up in there, finished off today's video, got it uploaded, uh, what else did I do? I finished, polished off today's blog post, got that published, um, did a workout at the gym, Came back here, got some lunch on the way, came here. And since then, I've been working solidly, uh, obviously, on videos. I did that interview earlier. I've, I'm doing this. I've done some other sharing type stuff on for, for today's video. Um, so, yeah, productivity-wise, because I've got this base to always come back to, and because it's not at home, so there aren't distractions. Uh, my family are safe and well over there. I know where they are. Um, but equally, they're not coming in and disturbing me as much as I love them. So having this space, um, and Alex will know this, he's got his own studio. Uh, it's just, it's just amazing. It's fantastic. Uh, it's, it's a, it's the biggest cost I have, but it's, I never feel bad about paying that rent invoice. That's the way I look at these things. Any overhead I have when that, when that invoice comes in and I have to remove the money from my bank account and give it to that person or that, that business. If I feel good about doing that and don't think about it, don't, don't hesitate it's worthwhile. Not all of the invoices that I pay are like that without going into too many details. But um, if that's the case, I tend to worry. But a very long way of answering your question, Mike. And yeah, that, there you go. Hope that helped. Um, another question from Mike. Someone else can jump in as well, guys. We've got nine people still on the um, on the live. Um, I'm loving these questions from Mike. But Mike, like I say, Mike's leading the way. Let's let's keep the questions coming in. Honestly, ask me anything. You can't embarrass me. We can try. Um, just anything, any, anything you think might be a bit. Should I ask him this about the business? What? Just do it. I'll, I'll answer you completely honestly. Um, another question from Mike. Anyway, uh, Mike, uh, what advice would you give a newbie when doing their first ten videos? Let me have a very quick drink of water. Um, when doing your first ten videos, um, I think I do what I did, which is not worry about the content. And my first 10 videos, in fact, my first eight videos, I think it was, um, they're still there. I'll, I'll never get rid of them. Um, if you've not seen them, it's go back and have a look. Um, but they were, I called them the diary series. Uh, and the reason I called them, called them the diary series is because they weren't, they were basically me diarizing, is that a word? Or charting, um, or documenting is a better word, um, my process of building this channel. And I would literally just sit down either in the kitchen or in the spare bedroom that was still being plastered and uh, just talk about something. So I, I think the, the very first video that I made on YouTube on Mark Ellis Reviews uh, was uh, talking about a book I was reading, a, a YouTube book. Um, that And I think the second, I can't, what was I saying? Oh, the second one I started, I was rambling on about the camera that I was using at the time. There was no, I mean, if, you, if, I, if I did that now, I'd get nowhere because I was darting between different things. But the reason I was doing that is because it did two things. The first thing is that it made me become consistent. So it got me into that mindset of creating and publishing one video per week. And since then, I've not failed it. I've never missed a week you know, not publishing something. Um, so it's getting consistent. And secondly, as you guess, it, it was about getting comfortable in front of the camera. Because if you haven't done this yet, the very first time you sit down in a room, 
with a camera, even though you kind of roughly know, well, you, you've seen other YouTubers do it, you've perhaps seen me do it, and you think, okay, I can imagine what it would be like to have a camera in front of me. Can't be that, can't be that tricky. Trust me, when you sit down and put this thing in front of you and just start talking, it's really weird. It's such a strange experience. It's still, to a degree, it still is now. I still have moments where, and anyone who's on this, uh, this live will probably, who's in the same position will know what I mean. I still have moments where I sit there and, and think, what are you doing? You know, if anyone walked past the window now and so, <laughs> watched what I was doing, which sometimes happens, and they'll be thinking, what, what's he, what's he up to? Um, so it's a, it's a very weird thing, but yeah, just, just, don't worry about the content. Your first 10 videos, probably no one's going to watch. You're going to watch them. Your mum might watch them. Your significant other might watch them. Your kids might watch them. And two or three people might drop by by mistake and watch them as well. But that, it doesn't matter. The, the viewership does not matter. What matters is becoming consistent and somehow uh, getting comfortable in front of the camera. <clears throat> James, uh, what do you hope the perception of Markerless Reviews is? Uh, what do you do to enhance that perception? And what do you and what do you think is the weakness of your brand? Great question. Um, the perception. Uh, I hope it's okay. <laughs> I think I think the perception, or I hope the perception of it is that this guy is just a fairly normal British bloke. You know, I've got a fairly nondescript um accent i think most people most people can't place where i'm from if you're interested i'm from northampton in the uk i don't sound like i'm from northampton which is not a bad thing um but i'm fairly like i say nondescript in terms of the way i talk and look and all that sort of stuff and i think because of that i've got that kind of every man thing going on it feels weird talking about myself like this but this this does appear to be what what the case is and because of that i think that makes me relatable to the right people it doesn't make me, make me relatable to everyone and i have as many people who don't like what i do as i do the people who do like what i do um but the people who do like what i do are people like me so it's people who love tech really love tech and perhaps also love this kind of production side of it as well and that, i take a deep interest in it but equally can't don't just can't be bothered with faff I use the word faff a lot. The older I've got, the less I want faff in my life. Um, and uh, also people who just don't, aren't bothered about benchmarks and that sort of stuff. So I think if the perception is that I'm the sort of person who they could take to the pub for a beer and talk about the, you know, the latest MacBook Air or the latest iPhone and not be bored to death by it and have a bit of a laugh about it. Because I don't take myself seriously. If you've seen most of my videos, they're, they're all a bit tongue-in-cheek, really. Um, I'm normally poking fun at myself in some way um, or at something else. Uh, not other people, obviously, but certainly at other things. Um, I hope that's how it comes across, James. Anyway, I've got no idea. If, that, if that's how it comes across, great. Um, in terms of the weakness, um, there's probably loads, to be, to be fair. I think uh, one of them is, and this is something that I'm stopping doing now, one of them is that I've been a bit too quick to reply to trolls. Um, and that has got me into a little bit of trouble uh, recently where I, I replied to someone um, and I wasn't nasty. I wasn't kind of, in fact, all, all I said was something like, what's it like to be that guy down the pub? And what I meant by that is that there's always a bloke down the pub who everyone thinks is a bit of an idiot. And um, I, this person kind of steamed into my comments and said something that made me react like that. And they they contacted me on, on Instagram about a week later and said, uh, Mark, you replied to me on, on that video and I just did, I thought it was a bit unfair. I was only asking a question, et cetera, et cetera. I went back and looked at the, the, the kind of comment thread and it did look a bit off. <laughs> I, I was a, slightly embarrassed by it. I, I apologized basically and said, look, you were caught in the crossfire. I had quite a lot of incoming flack on that video. And yeah, I shouldn't have reacted like that basically because he was just giving some criticism, uh, fairly constructive criticism. Um, but yeah, so I think that's one... Um, and that, that is a weakness of mine, I think. I think it's something that I, I need to just ignore now. And I, I am, I said this on my newsletter recently, I'm stopping replying to trolls. Uh, I'm just hiding them or just ignoring them, basically. So that's one weakness. Uh, what's my, my other weakness? So many to choose from. Um, I, I think I think sometimes I, I possibly do uh, dart between topics a little bit too much. So if you look at my videos, you know, I'm, I'm reviewing, for, for instance, today I've reviewed a camera. So I've reviewed this action cam from DJI. It's the first camera. I, is it? No, it's, it's one of very few cameras I reviewed. And going back to what I said a moment ago about my core audience liking the MacBook Air, the iPhone 13 mini, I think my desire not just to keep making the same video over and over again does occasionally push me into areas which 
they're a bit too experimental, possibly. Um, so that's, yeah, something else I need to work on. There's probably loads of weaknesses, James, I can't think off the top of my head. But if anyone can think of any in here, just let me know. Great question, though. Um, I, can't, I can't pronounce that name. But you've been on before. Fra Fragdenstein. Is that how you pronounce it? I don't want to get that wrong. Um, how much did you earn from your first sponsored video? Really good question. How much was it? Uh, I won't mention the brand. Um, I think the very first paid, uh, kind of upfront paid sponsored video that I did, I think was about $250, I think. Um, and this was very, very early on. This was probably, I think I had less than 10,000 subscribers. It wasn't very many at all. Um, yeah, about $250, which is about... 200 quid in UK money. Um, so not very much. And I think, again, it comes with experience. But even back then, it, the, the access to my audience was worth more than that from a marketing perspective. I, I used to be a marketer. And I always say this, that if I had any marketing dollars to spend now, I would I pump so much of it into influencer marketing, for want of a better phrase, uh, into content creators, um, because it's, it's just such a clever way so it's just a smart way of spending your marketing pounds or dollars you know you can get right in front of a very dedicated um trusting audience of that creator and uh but yeah i think i'm sure it's about 250 dollars yeah um not working with that brand anymore but um yeah uh, Santos, uh, hi from Connecticut. Can, 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 can't get my words out today. I won't even try and say that again. Um, hi from the USA. Um, with so much tech, how do you decide what to review? Good question. Uh, again, I have to think about the audience. So sometimes this is driven by sponsorships. So the reason that I, I reviewed that DJI Osmo Action 3 is because DJI offered to sponsor the channel. And that is a huge brand for me. Um, I'm not going to say no to that because one... I think that obviously there's a huge crossover between tech and camera tech. Um, and two, it's DJI. It's a big name to attach to my channel. So it's, a, it's an absolute no brainer. So sometimes that would drive my decision what to review. Apart from that, um, because I'm mainly focused on Apple stuff, it's quite straightforward. It's a case of, oh, they've launched a new MacBook. That's worth reviewing. Um, if it's a very tiny upgrade, it's not worth it. Um, the new iPhone, that makes sense. Um, Android phones, I have to be a bit selective with. So it makes sense to uh, review the, the S23 stuff because it's it, it competes so much against the iPhone. And if it competes against the iPhone, it's worth reviewing because that gets the, the audience really, really kind of, um, you know, they all set their trousers on fire about it. And that's great for engagement. So, um, yeah, it's, it, again, it's instinct really, Santos. Um, but thinking about my core audience and what, what they want to see me review, basically. Hello, Persona 1600. How are you doing? Uh, funnily enough, one of your old tracks came on uh, on my iPhone. So I had, I had, sorry, this is like a conversation between two old colleagues. Um, I had SoundCloud running, and one of your old tracks came on while I was at the gym. I'll leave that there, but uh, it just gave me a little, little smile. It was great as well. Um, Malcolm, let me just have a quick drink. Afternoon, Mark. Uh, how important do you think the sound and rhythm of the presenter's voice helps in promoting the in promoting the channel? I would be interested in your view. The sound and rhythm of a presenter's voice. Um, I think, I don't think it helps specifically. I think you just need to be yourself. I mean, I, I just talk normally and I still find it weird talking about this and referencing it, but it's, it is, it's kind of what I've heard quite a lot. So I have to, um, is that people do seem to like my voice which i still find weird because i don't like the sound of my own voice at all i hate editing my own voice um but see, people do seem to like it and i think the reason for that like i mentioned earlier is because it's fairly nondescript generic british bloke who you might meet down the pub and he'd be all right he wouldn't start a fight with you he might have a quite a good you have quite a good laugh with him have a couple of beers he's a nice bloke he he perhaps knows something about something very specific that's that's that kind of voice that i've got i think and um but I'm not putting it on. That is just the way I talk. Whereas if I put on another type of voice, there was someone, I'll tell you who it was, Jack Whitehall. Um, anyone who is in the UK in particular will know who he is. US people may know who he is. He was interviewed by um, Stephen Bartlett. Was it Stephen Bartlett? I think it was Stephen Bartlett. Or it was on the High Performance Podcast. He was on a podcast recently anyway, it's relevant. Um, and he was talking about the fact that when he first started doing comedy gigs, in fact, no, when, he, when he was first picked up by TV, um, I think he did the Big Brother, one of the Big Brother shows, 
he used to put on an accent. He used to put on this kind of fake Cockney accent. And if you know Jake, uh, Jake, Jack Whitehall, he's very, he's very posh. He's got a very kind of, uh, kind of public schoolboy, as he called it, uh, voice. And he, and he thought speaking in that voice would really diminish his possibility, his chances of making it on TV, because he thought people would just kind of poke fun at him. Um, but he very quickly started to realise that he just needed to be himself, because he was putting on this persona of someone else, and it wasn't him. He couldn't keep it up. It was exhausting. And he, he you know, looking back, he says he, he looks ridiculous having done that. And so he went, he, he started talking normally, and he's gone into the stratosphere. So uh, the point being, Malcolm, is that I don't think it matters. I think what's much more important is how you, is, is just being yourself. And again, targeting the right audience. And those people, those the, the right people will really like what you do and they'll like you and they'll trust you regardless of how you talk, even if you've got a stutter or if you, I don't know, if you, if you I, I have a, a bit of an issue where I talk too quickly sometimes and I don't always fully pronounced words a lot of people do this to be fair and um i've had to really work on that actually um but it doesn't actually matter because very few people seem to pick up on it so don't worry basically malcolm just talk, just be yourself um uh, jeff uh, do you do do you do or say things you don't want to just to get views i.e negative headlines for clickbait um do you do or say things you don't want to i always want to do or say the things that I say, if that makes sense. So I've never written a headline uh, or created a title for a YouTube video that I didn't want to create or that I kind of typed and thought, oh God, publish. I've never done that. Everything I've published has I've done with very much kind of um, with a lot of trust in, in what I'm doing. Um, so I guess that is probably, it's probably a no to that question really, Jeff. Um, in terms of generating negative headlines for clickbait, um, depends how you define that, but clickbait is so important. It's so misunderstood. Uh, I've talked about this before on, the, on these lives and without kind of going into it in deeply again, um, as long as you use it properly and, and click, you have to, use, if you want to stand any chance of being successful online, you have to use clickbait, no matter what you think of it. If you don't use clickbait, you're never going to get anywhere. It's as simple as that because the human brain and the way that we work, we, we, we thrive on that sort of stuff. We want to be excited, but then we want to be satisfied. So if I see something that's, that looks negative and it kind of makes me wince a bit, but it, it, it kind of sparks an interest, if I click on that thing, if A, the person delivering the, the value doesn't deliver the value, I'm not going to be impressed. If B, they really do deliver on what that that tile said, they've probably got me for a much longer time and I'll, I'll, I'll probably hit subscribe. So clickbait, um, yeah, I'll, I'll use a negative headline if it if it relates to what I want to create the content about and if I believe in whatever it is that I'm, I'm talking about. Um, I've done that quite a bit with Apple. There's a, quite a few videos and blogs that I've written and made about Apple that are very negative you know i think I've, I've done it recently about final cut pro i can't think what the title was but it was it was it was negative basically because i, I believe that was yeah, I, I believe it's not the not the best release james uh what uh, would you take big money would you take a big money sponsor from a brand you don't really care about slash aren't a fan of their product no no if, if, if i don't like their product um if i don't care about it definitely not um I suppose unless that product, I think, would benefit my audience. I'm, not, I'm, I'm trying. A great example of this. I, no, in fact, that's not a good example because it, it, it wasn't a it wasn't a sponsor. I was I was going to say remarkable, but they didn't. There was no payment involved there. Um, I can't think of an example of this. But if there's a product out there which I know my, a, a big section of my audience would really like to look at, but I'm not that fussed about. You know, I, I wouldn't take it home and use it myself. I probably would still take that because it's, it benefits my audience. It may not benefit me, but I can offer an, an opinion on it. I can also be honest and say, look, I wouldn't use this myself because it's not. I'm not the use case, but you may be. You know, so in that case, I would. Um, if I'm not a fan of a product, no. Um, I've got a very uh, recent example of this. Um, I can't show you, but over here, there's a Eufy security camera just out of shot. And uh, to cut a very long story short, um, basically three or four months ago, they were involved in quite a big uh, bit of controversy online. It all came from Linus Tech Tips. He basically found out that they were doing stuff with customer data, which kind of went against everything they said. Um, there, it wasn't illegal, nothing like that, but there was just a, a bit of a loophole they were, they were involved in with their customer data. And it was really bad. And what annoyed me is that I'd done two or, th two or three 
um, sponsored videos with Eufy, who, who are part of, um, who are they part of? That much bigger brand. Uh, it will come to me. Someone let me know in the comments, but I can't think of what the, what the name is. Um, <laughs> God, who is it? Someone let me know in, in the comments. Who are Eufy part of? Alex, if you're still there, you'll know. Um, but basically, I uh, it got it was that bad that I looked at it and thought, hang on a minute, I've I've been singing their pre anchor. Thank you, De uh, Darren, uh, part of anchor who are huge. Um, but it got that bad where I thought, hang on a minute, I've been kind of publicising what they told me was the way they dealt with customer data, and now I'm finding out that isn't the case. And I've got three was it no, it was one video in particular that I had on the channel, which went into detail on that and i thought i can't have that on my channel so i took it off that deleted the video basically and it was performing really well it had i think thirty thousand views or something it generated quite a bit of revenue for the brand and it was it was sponsored back then as well so I, I've, I've removed that video um i told them i said look it's gone i can't deal I, ca I cannot have that video on my channel it's not fair on the audience um two a couple of weeks ago i'm not betraying confidences with this a couple of weeks ago they got in they got in touch again and said look or their marketing um sorry their pr company got in touch and said look it's been a this is roughly what they said it's been a couple of months now um we've got eufy have got another new product coming out do you fancy doing another sponsored review and without even thinking about it i just said no um, and it would have been good money actually they, they do pay pretty well um but no it's a principal thing so hopefully that answers your question james <laughs> great question though The um, questions are flying in there. Travis, how long did it take you to ex how long did it take you to accept having to do the YouTube face in thumbnails? The YouTube face, the that stuff. Um, uh, immediately, I, I've got no shame really. I, I, again, I found this as I've got older, and as things have happened in my life, which have been pretty big events that aren't great. Um, you care less about that sort of stuff. If if you can get through a certain event in your life. Um, a certain personal event, uh, stuff, people saying, you know, kind of saying, why do you pull those stupid faces and thumbnails? Doesn't bother you, doesn't, doesn't scratch the surface. So I don't care what people think because it works. Um, I, I've tried thumbnails without them and they, I don't think they perform as well. And I don't care if, if a video performs well with it, with me pulling a stupid face. Great. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I, I have experimented with, um, doing uh, thumbnails that don't feature me at all. So I've done kind of top-down shots of products and stuff. They seem to perform uh, pretty well. Um, but yeah, I, I, it doesn't bother me at all, Travis, really. Persona 1600. How do you personally manage, how do you personally maintain the passion for a niche you turn it into a business without it becoming just another job? This is such a good question. It's something which, I've, I've again, I've talked about before on here, um, but it's a big question. Uh, uh, it's a big bugbear in a way of mine, which is that, I mean, a great example of this is that I've always been interested in, interested in photography for many, many years. Um, and as soon as I started making that part of my business before this, I fell out of love with it. I, I never used to take my camera out. I, I stopped basically taking my camera out with my family. Um, and yeah, I just, because the camera became this tool that I was using for work and it reminded me of work, which I wasn't enjoying as much back then. Um, so that was a really good reminder that you know if you turn something into a money making endeavor something that you previously just had as a hobby it does completely change the way that you approach it um and what you associate it with as well in terms of a niche like youtube so for marketless reviews for instance um you know i don't go home and play with my macbook i've got no interest in touching a mac after i've, I've finished up here same thing with my phone um is you know <laughs> they are very much tall as much as i love them and I, I find them fascinating i love talking about them and helping people buy the right ones um i beyond here I, I i do need i have to switch off because it's now it's now the business for me so in terms of maintaining the passion i think i I won't ever lose that passion for tech. I still find tech so interesting and um, I won't lose that basically. It's, it, even though it's a, it's a very much a job for me now. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't see myself getting bored of it. If I do get bored of it, then I don't know at that stage, I have to make a decision about what I do, but I just can't see that happening because I'm, I'm 42 now and I've been interested in tech since I was about 10. <laughs> so it's, it's lasted quite a long time basically. So again, it tells you, it kind of illustrates that you've got to pick the right niche. I've talked about this before, where when you pick a niche that you want to really hone in on, on YouTube or on any kind of content creation, make sure you've got the stamina for it because it will get, 
it will get quite intense and you really need to love that thing that you're you're wanting to create content on another question from persona uh wow recently downloaded fl studio mobile to start tinkering again oh sorry yeah so you're re referring to my little message about your your track um please do it and that is a good video idea actually as well um it was actually quite nice rob rob from the podcast who mentioned anchor who reminded me of anchor i don't know what anchor just vanished from my mind then it went and Dar and darren as well uh David, uh, have you ever been interviewed by any of the tech magazines? Would you do an interview for Mac Format? Uh, I don't know if you work for Mac Format, David, but yeah, I'd love to. Um, I've not done anything for tech uh, magazines, no. Uh, have I? No. I did some work. The closest thing I've come to is I did, I did some work with um, Apple Insider. I did some writing and a bit of video stuff for them. But I wasn't interviewed by them, really. I've been interviewed on podcasts for this sort of stuff, you know, talking about the, the business of YouTube. But um, no, nothing like that. But yeah, if you, if, you, um, if you work for Mac Format, I'd be happy to have a chat. Right. I think we're at the end of the questions. Have I missed any? I always worry that I miss, I miss a question somewhere. We've got another couple of minutes, so if anyone wants to throw in another question, then please do. I think we're probably at the end, actually. I can't see any more questions. Um, okay, I think we'll leave it there, guys. I think we're we're pretty much done. Uh, I am, like I said, I'm trying to find the best... Oh, we've got one here. No, thanks for answering. No, no problem at all. Happy, happy to help out. Um... Yeah, I'm trying to find the best timings for these lives. It's not easy uh, because people come in from all over the place. Uh, in fact, let's have a quick roll call before I finish. Let me know where you are in the world. Just pop it into the into the chat. And uh, that'd be, I love hearing where people are calling in from. But the, the whole point is that it's very hard to find a time that works for everyone. I, I do have people in Australia I know who want to join these lives, and it's very tricky finding a time for them that isn't in the middle of the night for me. Um, oh, Mike's got another question. Let's have one more from Mike. Uh, you've mentioned Notion in previous Q&As. What do you use it for? Uh, I use Notion for loads of stuff. So the, the best way to describe my usage of Notion is that I use it to uh, plan the uh, the content, really. I, I don't use it for to-dos. You know, my, my task list is all handled in Tick Tick. Um, but in terms of keeping track of what I'm doing with video production, blog production, newsletter production, you know, the process that, that all those things go through, that is what goes through Notion. So and I think I mentioned before, at some stage, I will launch a Notion template based on what I've built because I have built quite a quite an engine behind this behind this business. And I'd like to share it. So uh, that will be made available at some stage. Here we go. Uh, Abu Dhabi, Germany, Herefordshire, Switzerland, Liverpool. Uh, I can't pronounce it. Cal, Cal, Cal in Wiltshire. Uh, no, you do not work for Mac Format. Well, if you know anyone who does, like I say, David, then I'd be happy to, to speak to them. Um, David says, did your little boy have a nice birthday party? That's what well, a lovely question, David. Uh, he did, yeah. Uh, well, in fact, no, he, <laughs> he had a lovely birthday. So we had the his birthday was on Monday, which was a, a bank holiday in the UK. Uh, we went to the zoo, which is... I mean, he's, he's one, so he's got no idea what's going on. Um, but he just loved it every every second of it. Basically, he had a lovely day. We went to the pub afterwards, had some lunch. Um, it was just it was just a lovely day. Just everything about it was amazing. Um, but his actual party is on Saturday, this Saturday, and I, I've done very little in terms of organising it. We've got like a village hall booked out, and about seventy people coming. Uh, and <laughs> My girlfriend's done everything basically because she's she's amazing and she just lets me get on with the business. But um, while still also helping me with the business as well, she somehow manages to find time to do that, to you know look after our son during the day and also organize a big party. So that's happening at the weekend, uh, David. But thank you for asking. Uh, Eastern US, like I mean that illustrates you, you you're all from all over the place. So I, I, finding the right time is tricky, but I'm, I'm going to keep moving them around. Uh, and just seeing how we get on. But um, anyway, guys, I'm going to wrap things up there because I've had more than enough of your time. Uh, thank you so much for your questions. As always, it's, it's great to, that's what brings these things alive, basically. Um, and yeah, these will be happening every week, as always. And just a quick reminder, if you haven't subscribed, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell. Uh, and if you haven't joined the Substack newsletter list, I really do recommend checking that out and just seeing what I've got to say each Friday. And uh, yeah, as always, guys, thank you very much. And I'll catch you hopefully next week. Well, I'll definitely be there next week. 
hopefully you'll be there next week. But yeah, cheers. Have, the, have a good rest of your day. Cheers.